Um, okay, so it's 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 a pleasure to welcome all of you back in this auditorium, and um, also, of course, there are people joining in from Zoom. Um, especially, I see the director sitting in his office and uh, joining. Uh, Ramki, welcome. Um, I would like to sort of encourage people to join more. Um, we can have a fifty percent sitting capacity on in AG sixty six, so at least seventy to eighty people can join. um yeah, you know and we can have a safe sort of a, we can operate in a safe mode um so without further ado i would like to welcome for this session of the wednesday colloquium the nsf wednesday colloquium and um for those joining us for the first time uh i would like to sort of repeat that uh, the wednesday colloquium um is actually as old as tifr itself and um has been a forum for discussion for many many um very important topics it has brought important topics in front of the tifr scientific community um and um uh, be it the fundamental discoveries or some applications um it was conceptualized by our founding director professor homi bhaba who actually sort of had a vision that all the scientists within the institute especially the natural sciences faculty can get together and uh, listen uh, from the leading expert in in one of the communities of science right uh, it could be physics chemistry or biology um, setting up an important problem in front of everyone and having a cross disciplinary discussion on it and this is where the colloquium is very unique and uh, it can be done only in small settings and tfr is an institute where all of us can get together in such a setting so um with that history i would like to actually welcome today uh, one of our own in fact it's a welcome party for um our youngest member in the institute uh, dr amitesh anand uh, maybe not the youngest at this point but maybe in 3 months uh, he has joined in december so this this colloquium belongs to his uh, welcome um amitesh just a brief uh, sort of uh, uh, description of amitesh's expertise and work um amitesh actually was trained in the right field chemistry uh, and uh, he got his bachelor's in chemistry and I'm, i'm actually looking at ullas right now so uh, <laughs> and um, of course the, with various uh, flavors of chemistry you have a chance and opportunity to jump either to physics or biology so um he, uh, he actually sort of did his um uh, did his masters after finishing his bachelor's in bhu in institute of science in chemistry he went to do his masters in biomedical sciences where he just switched over um and this is in uh, uh, from dr b r ambedkar center of biomedical research which is part of university of delhi so uh he went there and he spent two years there and then in 2011 he joined the group of rajesh gokhale um which is in the uh, csir igib institute where he spent most of his time discovering new kinds of quinones and um and 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 uh, had some very interesting work resulting from uh, his his phd work with rajesh gokhale um after his phd he finished in 2016 he moved to university of california san diego and that is where he actually worked with um, uh, professor bernhard palsen um, and he has very interesting results from um, uh, uh, the work uh, in in his postdoc which some of it he might uh, go through and share uh, today uh, but one of the things that i really uh, like in 
the work of uh, Dr. Amitesh Anand is the fact that he has kept in touch with the ideas of basic chemistry in, in bioenergetics. And this is something that I'm looking forward to and the flavor of the colloquium um, sort of will be to connect these two disciplines. So thank you Amitesh for doing this and I welcome you in front of the TIFR audience um, and uh, I welcome you for the talk. Okay, for that introduction and for the first time after about two years, I'm going to remove mask in front of my audience in person. Okay. Now I don't need to ask uh, whether I'm visible, audible, and all not. Cool. Uh, but then uh, those connecting online, I hope I'm visible and audible. Okay. So with that, uh, uh, thanks Jody for this uh, invitation and this welcome. Um, when Jody invited me for this uh, colloquium, I said I'm not very comfortably placed uh, to this uh, to give this or deliver this colloquium. So can we delay it? It was like no, just talk about it. Then I realized that it will, it will never be the most ideal time. So why not now? So with that, um, what I'm going to talk today. So I tried coming up with this catchy title, Hard to Break, because they have learned it the hard way. And this is in recognition to the fact that these microbes have really, really dealt with a lot. And towards the end of it, I'll try showing that these microbes are not real villain. But I'll start with showing them their uh, villainous nature. Okay. Now, the thing that I have to be careful about is the audience composition. Though I see a lot of you from DBS, there are others from chemistry and uh, I think mathematics, physics. <laughs> so I, I, I have tried to be careful about uh, uh, my content and the slide composition. So I hope I'll do justice. And then uh, uh, I normally do not get deep because of questions being asked. So on biology, uh, non biology audience, if I'm making a thing, uh, if there is anything not clear, please interrupt. Yeah, I can do it from okay. the computer. Okay, thanks Jody for the slide. <laughs> okay, so earlier when I used to talk about my work, I used to spend a couple of slides talking about the relevance of uh, working in the field of infectious diseases and all and all. I tried uh, convincing you why we should devote time and resource in understanding infectious uh, diseases. Now that's not required. So what I do is I just uh, open the slide and I just take a pause. And you guys are convinced that we should work in the field of infectious disease. We should try to understand both fundamental and translational aspect of the field. Okay. With that, we are already in this pandemic. Uh, though UK has declared that pandemic is over, there are some section of our community also who think that the community is over. Uh, sorry, pandemic is over. Hopefully, community is not over. <laughs> um, I, I wish this pandemic uh, gets over very soon, but then another pandemic is imminent. And this time it's not gonna be virus, this time it's gonna be bacteria. And this pandemic is not something that is gonna, that's, that's arising abruptly from some part of the world and spreading everywhere, uh, uh, all across the globe. Rather, it is very subtly and very steadily penetrating into the population. This is the data, from 2019 published in Lancet, where what they have looked at is a global burden of antimicrobial resistance. And uh, it's, a, it's a real shame that uh, in 2019, about 1.27 million deaths were directly attributed to bacterial antimicrobial resistance. That too, the leading pathogen was E. coli. I'll repeat, the leading pathogen was E. coli. 
And the reason I am repeating it is that we believe that we know in and out about E. coli. And now with that knowledge, if E. coli is leading as a pathogen, just imagine condition about the pathogens or the bacterial species where we have minimal knowledge or no knowledge. No knowledge. And uh, I have highlighted uh, 2019 in bold and in red, because whatever is depicted on the slide is from pre-COVID era time. All of you know what has happened in the, during the second wave of uh, COVID-19, especially in the Indian context. There was a chaos. Antibiotics were being uh, uh, like uh, popped in uh, like uh, toffees, candies, and then, uh, of course, that has become a major driver for antimicrobial resistance. So what you saw on the previous slide for 2019 is going to get escalated in an unprecedented manner in coming years. So this, if I can call pandemic, is imminent. It is lurking around. So we have to be prepared for it. Just to give an idea, you said 1.27 million from E. coli, right? No, 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 no. 1.27 million was because of in general from bacterial MR. All, all bacteria. All bacteria. And do we know how much is because of resistance to our abuse of antibiotics and so on? Okay. You're asking about uh, whether within this AMR, what all percent of this micro, uh, this resistance, uh, resistant microbe is due to misuse of antibiotics? Exactly. Um, that, uh, as if, like, that, I don't think that information is there. Yeah. In fact, that's a very, what is, uh, very, that's not a uh, like a quantitative thing. That's a very qualitative thing where we think that this misuse and all is driving this evolution, uh, antimicrobial uh, resistance evolution. I don't think we have those figures. Yeah. Okay. Now to make the situation worse, Major big pharmas are now abandoning uh, their pursuit of uh, coming up with new antibiotics. And if you look at the business model, they are not at fault. They have every right to do it. Because attractive model is where you expect a high sale for a new product that you're launching. Unfortunately, in case of antibiotic, you come up with a superior molecule, you come up with a new molecule, a new antibiotic, but then the idea is to minimize its use so that there is no resistance emerging for that new molecule. So that is just against the principle of profit in business. Now, when you're coming with a new molecule or a new product, which is an advanced product, you want to price them higher. That's not true for antibiotics. There are lots of regulations and that molecule, that antibiotic has to be affordable. For that, there is regulatory bodies that controls the price of those antibiotics. Again, second beautiful business model thrown out of the window. Now, high cost to benefit ratio. You want that uh, your input, input is mitigated and you have huge profit there. Unfortunately, we have numbers for this and that's not true. Uh, this estimate is, uh, I think, uh, from 2017, in which uh, uh, they estimated that uh, cost of delivering one antibiotic was about 1.5 billion US dollars. And then the revenue that it generated was just 46 million US dollars per year. Although over the year, this, this number will go up. But over the year, microbes will again up the antibiotics and the product will be complete. So it's as good to compare what, whatever number is there. So third aspect of your attractive business model failed. Now fourth is when you want to venture into business, you always want to, and to work in an area where you have opportunity for growth. That's not there in antibiotic business. We have exhausted most of the tired drug target space. Cell wall synthesis, division, protein translation, all these avenues have been explored we have molecules targeting them and we have resistance for all those molecules. So we do not have lots of opportunities to grow. As a scientist, 
we cannot contribute towards the first three uh, limitations, but we can contribute towards this fourth, this uh, issue of uh, non availability of longer hanging fruits. Of course, so now that other uh, target space is uh, diminishing, people have started looking into newer uh, uh, targets. And one particular target that is now becoming uh, very attractive and people are talking a lot about it is bioenergetics. And rightly so, because when you want to develop a drug, there are two things that you want. One is that your drug should be very effective and it should not affect you. It should only affect your pathogen. There are lots of things in microbial bioenergetics, which is unique to them. So you can easily use them to develop a potential, a very effective uh, therapeutic avenue. So, and uh, uh, these two guys, uh, uh, the first author and the last author of uh, the first review article, they two are kind of the strongest proponent of bioenergetic bio as the uh, target space for uh, developing in your uh, micro uh, antimatic, uh, antimicrobials. Okay. Uh, one of the advantages of uh, targeting bioenergetics uh, for antimicrobial is that uh, bioenergetic plasticity contributes a lot towards microbial adaptation, be it its active growth, its latent growth, or its uh, multicellular assemblage. So unlike what we think about microbes, unlike what we see in our laboratories, these microbes do not grow in those flask or shake, uh, shaking cultures in nature. In nature, they are mostly into some sort of multicellular assemblage. One of the common uh, multicellular assemblage that we are, at least uh, uh, those working in the field of uh, biology are aware of is biofilm. This biofilm is very interesting. These microbes are in a very uh, advanced uh, association. They have every virtue of multicellular organism. They communicate, they coordinate, they compete. And that's why treating against biofilm becomes even more uh, problematic. Your drug may not uh, uh, go all the way to the target cells. Even if your drug is going, the target pathway may not be as active as it is in shape plus culture. So there are lots of uh, problems associated with it. And it is solely due to the kind of uh, bioenergetic plasticity they have, which allows them to form these kind of structures. So, and in fact, uh, when we started uh, targeting uh, or talking about uh, bioenergetics as the antimicrobial target, 2012 was one of the year where uh, uh, we got a huge boost because there was this molecule beta colony that was approved in a fast track mode against uh, uh, drug resistance, uh, drug resistant uh, microchip tuberculosis. And we were all excited that this molecule might become the molecule that we are looking for treating tuberculosis. Unfortunately, just a couple of years uh, uh, after the introduction of uh, this molecule, we are now uh, seeing a huge rise in resistance against this molecule also. So hope is again, again dashing away. Uh, this molecule targets uh, ATP synthesis, which is again part of uh, bioenergetics. Now, what I believe and what is one of the prime reason behind we being we trying to introduce a, a new molecule and these microbes getting adapted to that or these microbes getting uh, resistance against that is that we are probably not looking into their compensatory potential, their plasticity in depth. So there's this concept of proximal and distal impact. Whenever we do anything, whenever do we create any sort of intracellular or extracellular perturbation on any system, they react in two ways. One is proximal. That's the immediate effect that you see right after the introduction of whatever perturbation that you have done. But then every system has some degree of plasticity. They try to deal with it. They try to come up with a way to sustain in that perturbed environment. And that's when we start seeing this distal impact. So um, stealing uh, Dobzhensky's quote, I now believe that uh, nothing, in, nothing in microbiology makes sense except in the light of adaptive laboratory evolution. Adaptive laboratory evolution, uh, though the, now, though the uh, nomenclature seems very fancy, it's a very simple approach. What we do is that we create any perturbation, 
either by uh, changing any extracellular uh, parameter or by doing some sort of genetic uh, perturbation within the cell, within the cell. And then we grow that microbe for a number of generations. And then we try to see whether the microbe is now getting adapted to that changed environment. And once, it, uh, once we find that the strain has now optimized, it, uh, its uh, growth potential has restored either fully or uh, partly, then we go on characterizing, then we go on uh, figuring out what was the compensatory pathway that allowed it to kill us. Yes. Oh, I would like to step back a little bit and ask another question is that sure. particularly for evolution of um, antimicrobial resistance or let's say evolution of any new trade, one of the initial requirements is that you go through an evolutionary bottleneck, right? And there's this concept that is emerging, if I'm not wrong, I, you, you know this better, is that high dose of antibiotics were for a short period versus low dose of long periods of antibiotics because the the capacity to emerge or develop resistance because of your compensatory pathways or the distal effect is essentially when you put through the put, through the, put the systems through an evolutionary bottleneck. Yeah. Is there any sense of low dose versus low dose long periods versus high dose short period treatments in the context of at least in the laboratory? I'm not talking about in clinical context because it becomes a lot more complicated. Yeah. Are you aware of any experiments that have compared low dose? Uh, effects for long range or high dose for short strain in terms of evolutionary yeah. Um, yeah, adaptations? That's a brilliant question. We have done it. Uh, I haven't done it. My colleague at uh, my previous lab at uh, UCSD, they have done it. So they were trying to uh, develop antibiotic uh, resistance. So basically, they use this um, uh, antibiotic and they tried to. Uh, I can use the name. I'm just not using the name because that's not yet published. So what they have done is that they used uh, one antibiotic at two different doses. One was uh, about the lethal dose and uh, another was, uh, I think, uh, uh, they have used three doses, half and one tenth. So these three doses and they started with the same strain. And what they observed that with the higher dose, highest dose, many a times these micro fail to uh, show those, uh, what do you say, uh, adaptive uh, mutations. But when you have lower dose, which is challenging their growth, but which is not killing them, then in that case, uh, the emergence of uh, antibiotic resistance is higher. Am I making sense to you? Yeah. Yeah. So, and we believe that's because when you do not kill them, when you like, you do not kill them substantially, you allow them to grow, then they are being able to create that heterogeneity in the population within which they find some of the mutation, which is now making them. Uh, resistant to that particular metabolite. Yeah, so this is also something that I've noticed. But TB, the treatment is about you know many months. Yeah. Right. Yeah. While for many other things, it's just a few days. Yeah. Right. So I'm just wondering, triggered by that question, that uh -huh. is, is the TB thing a low dose over a long time, and then uh, for colds and coughs or fevers, it's just like you know slam the guy right in the first few days and finish it. So is, does it depend on the nature? Of course, it depends on the nature of the bacteria and the tumor. Yeah, yeah. But also, it makes me wonder uh, that you know sometimes if you apply very high dose, is the response always proportional to the dose that you apply? Does it become nonlinear, like it happens in so many other cases? Um, I mean, this is what is called saturation, yeah, dumping, and then all sorts of other effects might happen. Yeah. So one of the problems, specifically for, uh, in terms of tuberculosis treatment, is that. So long uh, is because of uh, the complex nature of microbiome tuberculosis. Their life cycle or the lifestyle is very complex. So they live in something called active form and then they go into this dormant form. So in order to eradicate, eradicate them completely along like uh, latent form along with the active form, we have to do this uh, long drug uh, treatment regimen. Coming back to uh, whether we can find a correlation between uh, uh, where we are doing short term treatment, you talk about cold and flu. So I will probably shy away from comparing tuberculosis with that because uh, they have two different uh, uh, causative organisms. But within the bacterial system, um, as I responded with, uh, to Ulas's question, um, if you are not using uh, uh, lethal concentration, if you are using uh, sublethal uh, concentration, then are you only talking about resistance, emergence, or in general? Uh, in general, the response of the body mm -hmm. to high doses. Yeah, so 
if I uh, do not consider this issue of resistance emergence, then high doses treatment will be more effective in terms of killing the microbe. But then, as you know, every molecule has side effect on our body also. So we also have to kind of fine tune that thing. So that becomes an issue when we go for dosing uh, and all uh, in uh, these uh, antibiotics. Amitesh, I hope I answered it properly. Amitesh, there are some, uh, you know, there are lots of uh, microbes which are friendly microbes. A lot. Yeah. So, yes. So if you are in mostly, uh, one has to be also careful about exactly uh, you know, when you are playing with the dose. Yeah. I think in case of TB, that is one of the. Uh, yes. 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 Resistance. I mean, a lot of exactly. people are reevaluating whether three days of high doses is better than five days of low doses. But evolutionarily, you should be able to spin it and say, what is the creating an evolutionary bottleneck? Yeah. Which is now allowing emergence of resistance. Come again. What is the evolutionary bottleneck? Mm -hmm. And therefore, what is the emergence of uh, resistance? Is that a question or comment? I said you should be able to answer that in the future. Okay. We I still didn't on. get the question. It's not a question. It's... Yeah. I think I think what Ullas' meaning is which pathway does it need to take? But there is a bottleneck oh, okay. of the evolution. Okay. okay. Yeah. So of... on that, what once is that? Um, um, uh, if I subtle, talk about the mechanism, are you talking about the mechanism of uh, uh, emergence of uh, resistance? Yes, yes. Oh, subtle difference. That okay, yeah. So in that case, there are uh, multiples. Uh, one is that uh, they play around with the uh, target of that uh, molecule. And then um, in majority of the cases, these uh, drug resistance comes because of uh, uh, their uh, higher activation of efflux pump. So they try to throw out the molecule. Uh, comparing mechanisms across high dosage and low dosage oh, okay, is very okay. useful. Yeah. Yeah. That will be interesting. I'll do that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ulas. Thanks, everyone. Okay. So with that, um, I just introduced this concept of proximal and, and uh, uh, the need for of doing this adaptive laboratory evolution. So um, today, I'm going to mostly talk about uh, adaptive plasticity in microbial bioenergetics. And uh, before I jump into the topic, I'll take uh, maybe two, three minutes to talk about my motivation and why I actually uh, started working in the field of bioenergetics. And uh, as Jody mentioned, um, I'm a chemist by training. I still consider myself as a chemist. I have a very, uh, what do you say? <laughs> okay, before, <laughs> I'm not looking at Ullas. Okay. So, so when I joined uh, 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 Dr. Gokhale's lab, uh, their group had a very, very uh, interesting observation. So by the time they had figured out that there is this molecule, um, oh no. okay. So there's this molecule uh, that we later named as polyketide quinone. This molecule is synthesized by mycobacterium sphingitis. Later we figured out that this molecule is synthesized by mycobacterium tuberculosis also. But this molecule is only formed in a particular growth style or life uh, growth phase of uh, microbacterium that is again biofilm. So when I joined, he had this observation and then he wanted me to figure out the biological context of it. Why this molecule is being formed and that too, why is this molecule formed only in the biofilm. Um, there my chemistry training came handy. I looked at the structure of the molecule. And I could think of three possible uh, uh, uses of this kind of molecule. One is that if you look at uh, one four keto group, it immediately tells that it will be a rocks active molecule. Another is that uh, there are pylons kind of molecule which are involved in quorum sensing, which is again very important in um, uh, biofilm formation. Quorum sensing is nothing but uh, communication within uh, bacterial cells. Third was uh, somehow uh, cross-linking with the extracellular uh, matrix which enables this biofilm formation. And the reason I thought that this may be important for this uh, cross-linking is that uh, we had this nice observation that uh, when microbacterium does not produce this molecule, the biofilm formation ability is compromised. So, okay. So, 
This one is uh, PKS10. So before I get into this, uh, this molecule is by, uh, by synthesized by this three gene cluster. One is type three polyketide synthase, another is uh, methyl transferase, and then oxidoreductase. They use uh, uh, long chain fatty acyl CoA along with the methyl melanyl CoA and melanyl CoA. These three are the substrate. Using that, they form this polyketide unit, which undergoes this aldol condensation to form this uh, uh, cyclic uh, uh, ring. And then that is acted upon by methyl transferase and oxidoreductase to result in this final molecule. Now, what I've done, what we have done over here is that we have deleted this gene PKS10, which is the type 3 PKS uh, involved in the uh, uh, biosynthesis of this molecule. So when this molecule is not biosynthesized, what happens is that uh, they lose the stability. The biofilm loses its stability. And microbacterial, uh, microbacterial biofilm has this characteristic reticulation, which imparts stability to it. This stability is completely gone. And when we complement this molecule from outside, we do see restoration of biofilm stability along with its characteristic reticulation. So that was why I also started looking into the cross-linking aspect of this molecule. But then to cut the story, uh, story short, uh, that quorum sensing aspect didn't uh, hold true and the same was for uh, cross-linking. And uh, then I started looking into the uh, bio bioenergetic aspect of it. And uh, uh, because this molecule bears similarity with the ubiquinone, which again has this what four keto group, uh, the difference is that in case of ubiquinone, you have this long isoprenoid chain, whereas in this case, the molecule has this long alkyl chain. But the similarity is that despite having, um, uh, despite not having isoprenoid chain, this molecule is also localized in the membrane, potentially because of this long alkyl chain. So uh, we thought that somehow this molecule is involved in respiratory electron uh, shuttling. So what we did is that uh, we started using an alternate electron acceptor, nitrate. And what we observed that in a dose dependent manner, this alternate electron acceptor nitrate was being able to restore stability and the reticulation in the biofilm. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. How did you identify the structure, exact structure of the molecule? Did you like isolate it and then do a chemical characterization yes. like NMR yeah. or something yeah. or? Yeah. So two things uh, came handy over here. One was uh, Dr. Gokhale's experience. So he has been working with polyclide synthesis for yes. a long time. So we knew what kind of chemistry can do. Then of course, we did uh, uh, MASPEC and NMR both. MASPEC and NMR. Yeah. So because- Doing the... NMR was not that easy because this molecule was being produced in a very small quantity. Yes. So I remember uh, uh, spending several weeks in the lab without sleeping. I am uh, trying to collect as much biofilm as possible and isolate from there. And that to that also, I used to get like bare, barely like minimal quantity of it to just run one uh, spectra. And then the spectra was not very clean. So only thing that we could comprehend from that spectra was that what are the fingerprints of this molecule, like uh, right. your uh, keto group, your methoxy group, your methyl group, that's all. We were never able to uh, figure out the length of this alkyl chain using yeah, that NMR. would be my question because NMR will get congested yes, in the aliphatic yes. region. We, we were not able to do that. Okay. There. The other question. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Just let Con me just just frame it out. Um, the other question is: Yes, quinones have these very nice redox properties. Have you ever checked the redox potential of these? And did you see a, like a cycling between the protonated, the semi-quinone, and the quinol form? Yeah. Okay. We, we did that. We did that. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, we did that uh, in uh, collaboration with the uh, Department of Chemistry at uh, uh, Delhi University. So we have those uh, spectra. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this nitrate result gave us this uh, uh, hint that uh, it's the improper dissipation of electron that is probably impacting uh, the biofilm formation. And then uh, we went on doing uh, some reconstitution assay where we, uh, uh, what we tried. So basically what we wanted to see was whether this molecule is being able to transfer electron to cyclone C reductase which is a component of electron transport chain. Uh, unfortunately, now again, uh, my chemistry folk will agree with me that keeping this molecule in its uh, uh, reduced form was tricky. I spent, uh, I think, not less than a month at NCL trying to get this molecule in its reduced form because the oxidized form was available with us. But uh, we were able to successfully reduce it. But by the moment we come to doing other experiments, the molecule was auto oxidized. So in that case, what we did is that we combined it with an enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase. And this from literature, we got the information that alcohol dehydrogenase can reduce this molecule. 
So that's how we come up with this uh, in vitro reaction where we are using a uh, cytochrome C as the readout, cytochrome C reductase as the uh, our main uh, what do you say parameter that we want to judge whether we are being able to transfer electron or not. And we observed that uh, actually uh, this molecule was being able to uh, transfer electron to cytochrome C reductase. So it can function in electron transport chain. There were a lot of things uh, done because this was about uh, about seven years of work four years of mine and three years of uh, my co-authors work. So a total seven years of work. So there are lots of data. Uh, your colleagues, please do read this uh, work. It's an interesting one. There, are lots, uh, there is a lot more than what I uh, talked about. Okay, so this is where I got interested in this molecule, uh, uh, one fourth keto containing molecule and especially ubiquinon because it's there from, it's from ubiquinon I drew all the parallels and I started looking into this molecule. And it was, that time when I came across this interesting observation or how do you say interesting uh, story about uh, evolution and diversification of uh, quinone molecules. So what has happened in evolution is that uh, uh, as we know, um, early earth was anaerobic or at max uh, microaerobic. At that point of time, most of the microbes were only using nephthoquinone uh, for their respirations. Um, is this structure visible? It's Barely visible. So I can tell. So basically, um, there are two different uh, respiratory uh, quinones which are uh, known in the microbial system. One is ubiquinone. Ubiquinone has that uh, uh, benzoquinone based ring. Nephthoquinone has this uh, nephthine containing. Uh, nephthoquinone, as the name suggests, uh, having this nephthine ring. Um, so all the what do you say, organisms existing in uh, uh, anaerobic earth or environment where there was no oxygen or less oxygen, they're using this uh, nephthoquinone for their respiration. It's only when about uh, 2.6 billion years ago when cyanobacterial bloom happened and earth environment started to receive a fair bit of oxygen, there was this uh, divergence, uh, diversification in quinone content. Some microbes acquired this new biosynthetic pathway for this molecule, ubiquinone. Now in present condition, we have three different kinds of microbial species. One that has still retained biosynthetic ability only for ubiquinone. Another that can form both uh, the primitive one, nephthoquinone, and the new one, ubiquinone. And that there are some very, I think, a minimal amount of microbial species, which are more advanced, that can only form ubiquinone. I think I missed something in the first, uh, in like about this first uh, strain. So this first strain has retained biosynthetic ability for the primitive one, not for ubiquinone. Okay. Yep. Can I ask a question at this time? Yes. Yeah. Uh, look, look, ask, please. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, can you explain what is a quinone and what is its functional um, uh, functional uh, aspect uh, in the cell's well-being? Sure. Or the organism's well-being. Yes. 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 Uh, we are turning the camera. Yeah. Hello, you can see the board now? Yes, I can, but uh, very small. Oh, very small. So, uh, so Alok, small. I will do something. Uh, no, it's okay. Just, just, just let it be because I don't want to take too much time. Okay. Well, uh, I can unshare the screen if you want. Okay. Okay. No. Uh, can you can you just zoom out? Yes, your... I can. I can. I can. I can. I can see. I can see it. Okay. So that he has drawn the structure of a quinone. This is basically the benzoquinone. Yeah. So what I've drawn over here is the ring structure, the core ring structure for ubiquinone. And yeah. in case of uh, uh, nephthoquinone, you have this uh, another ring over here. And then the isoprenoid unit is mostly the same. And uh, I think uh, you also asked about uh, the physiological role of these molecules, right? Yeah. Yeah. So these molecules are involved in uh, electron transport chain. So their prime job is to take electron from um, uh, NAD's dehydrogenase which is the uh, entry for electron into electron transport chain. And then they uh, move along the membrane and transfer it to uh, oxidases, cytochrome oxidases. Did I make it clear? Uh, yes, um, but you know, uh, not being either a chemist or a biologist, uh -huh. it's a little uh, uh, okay. the so, hair. Let, let me, uh, so, we know about uh, this electron transport chain. 
So electron transport chain is, uh, uh, so we have lots of enzyme complexes on membrane. There are some electron, uh, some enzyme complexes which can take electron from this molecule called NADH. And taking this electron, they pump out proton into the periplasmic space in case of a uh, prokaryotic system. Okay. Okay. And then this electron through these quinones get transferred to another enzyme complex called cytochrome oxidase. Now cytochrome oxidase takes this electron from these quinones and then transfer it to oxygen where I, oxygen gets reduced to water. Okay. Due to this flow of electron, you have proton being pumped out from the cytosol to periplasmic space. Okay. So you have this proton motive force being generated in the periplasmic space. Now this proton motive force is utilized for the rotation of ATP synthase. And that's how ATP is being formed. So this electron transport chain allows um, microbes and us to form ATP using this proton motive force, which is uh, generated uh, uh, as I described uh, through these enzyme complexes along with these quinones. Okay, so this must be a very universal thing because you, everybody needs ATP and um, uh, you know the respiratory chain is has to be there. Yeah. So you, you this must be a very universal thing. That's that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, electron transport uh, system is universal. Okay. And uh, what I'm talking about, so there are like that's why I said that uh, bioenergetics becomes a very uh, interesting uh, target for bio, um, antimicrobial development. Because uh, despite this universal nature of this pathway, uh, the components which are involved in this electron transport system is unique to uh, prokaryotic or eukaryotic system. And then within prokaryotic system also, we have lots of diverse, diversification in terms of what all enzyme complexes are there, kind of uh, respiratory quinones they are using. And so, you know, maybe another question, how does one um, system become dominant? Uh, like all these forms of quinones you are talking about, yeah. uh, they have also evolved uh, from 4.6 billion years to 2.6 billion years to now present day. Yeah. But you know what determines the the, the, the evolution of all these alternate um, forms? You are stealing the thunder. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Go ahead. I'm, I'm going to talk about that. So this uh, this is a presentation is primarily about that. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, I'll shut up. No, no. So, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely take care of that question and uh, I'll come back to you if I made the thing clear or not. But do you have any other question? No, please go ahead. Okay. So, as said, uh, in the present uh, environment, we have uh, three different kinds of uh, uh, microbial species. Some that has retained primitive quinone as the sole uh, respiratory quinone for their electron transport system. There are others, in fact, uh, almost all gram negative bacteria. They have this biosynthetic ability for both the quinone types. And then there are some which only have this uh, biosynthetic ability for the newer uh, quinone type, that's UA quinone. Now, what is interesting and what is paradoxical is that uh, um, microbes that have biosynthetic ability for both these quinone types uses these quinones in different conditions. So when they are living in an aerobic condition, they prefer to use UV quinone, the newer metabolite. And when they are in an anaerobic condition or microaerobic condition, uh, the dominant species become nephthoquinone, the primitive quinone. Whereas microbial species that do not have this luxury of two different biosynthetic pathway, they solely rely on nephthoquinone for both their aerobic and microaerobic respiration. So that's where we wanted to see why organisms which have this luxury of two different quinone types undergo this oscillation. Now, just a small comment. I think it's important to list out the redox potentials. It just helps um, yeah. the context a bit better, especially sure, sure. for Allah's question and so, other people's question. Because how do you place the ubiquinone and the naphthoquinone I in hope. potentials? That would be reasonable because with respect to the enzyme redox potentials, you know that that changes the landscape of where the electron transfer reactions can sort of um, take place, not take place. If, if the redox environment, the, the microbe has to adapt to what kind of redox poise exists within the system. And you can use any of these quinones, I guess, because certain potentials are being, you're facing certain potentials. So I think a discussion on redox poise would be important, I think. Yeah, so 
uh, the redox potential of uh, newer metabolite, uh, ubiquinone, is higher than the redox potential of the primitive uh, ubiquinone, that's neptopinone. And uh, I guess the chemical explanation for that is uh, embedded in their chemical, uh, their ring structure, because uh, one is uh, uh, non-aromatic, whereas the other one is aromatic. So the chances of this non-aromatic molecule, once it gets uh, reduced to an aromatic molecule, coming back to its oxidized form is lesser compared to the primitive one. And that's why I believe that uh, uh, we have numbers that ubiquinone is uh, having higher redox potential, but that's the explanation why probably uh, ubiquinone is having this higher redox potential. Okay, so in that context, uh, now what we wanted was to do some sort of uh, recreation. And two things we wanted. We wanted to recreate uh, something that might have happened on Earth some 2.6 billion years ago. So we have, uh, uh, I can say, complete understanding of the biosynthetic uh, pathways for ubiquinone and for neptokinone also. What happens is that uh, you have this molecule uh, corismate. This corismate is either acted upon by UBIC, which is the corismate lyase, resulting in formation of 4-hydroxybenzoate, uh, which then goes towards ubiquinone biosynthetic pathway. The same uh, molecule, uh, corismate, if it is acted upon by uh, isocorismate synthase, then uh, it goes towards neptokinone biosynthetic pathway. So what we have done is very simple. We deleted UVIC, hoping that uh, in the absence of corismate lyase, there won't be any formation of ubiquinone. We later verified that uh, it is actually true by using a uh, mass spec and uh, anal analyzing whether the molecule is being formed or not. So now, and, uh, now I should actually use the name uh, of the organism that we are going to talk about in coming slides. So we are using E. coli. Again, E. coli is a gram-negative bacteria, and it is one of the microbe that has this luxury of forming both quinone types, ubiquinone and neptokinone. So within that uh, organism, we deleted this UVIC gene so that now this strain will not be forming ubiquinone, and it will be solely relying on neptokinone for its respiration. Neptokinone came first. Naptokinone has a really complex structure as compared to ubiquinone. Wouldn't it have been easier for the bacteria or the life species to directly have ubiquinone? Oh, okay. No answer. Sir, thank you. Mm. Oh, no, I have answer. Mm. Oh. The answer lies a bit in... Uh, the cost of these metabolic production. Okay. And uh, allow me 10 minutes. Okay. Um, just give me 10 minutes. I'll come to that. Okay. So I was just talking about the design uh, of the, um, the study over here. We created an organism which is going to serve as a proxy of a pre great oxidation event uh, microbe. And then we evolved this uh, microbe in modern condition, which is aerobic condition. And uh, what you see over here is a uh, evolution trajectory. So on uh, x-axis, you have number of generations. Uh, how many number of generations we have uh, keep, kept on propagating them to allow them to achieve higher growth rate or whatever feature we are interested in. And then on uh, uh, y-axis, you have growth rate. Uh, the black line is for wild type. Wild type, which has both the quinone types, nephoquinone and ubiquinone. So you can see that uh, wild type, uh, the initial growth rate is about uh, 0.7 per hour. And after evolution, it goes to all the way about 0.95 to almost a one per hour. Whereas uh, neptokinone dependent strain, that is UVIC deleted strain, uh, to start with, it has a, a reduced growth rate, which is about 0.5 uh, or 0.55 per hour. After evolution, growth rate improves a bit. In about 150 generations or so, uh, the strain started to grow with a growth rate about 0.7 per hour. And uh, as said, the uh, wild type grows to a growth rate of about one per hour. So we were hoping to be able to get this strain, the deleted strain, evolved to one per hour. And with that hope, we continued this evolution experiment for about 900 uh, generations. But after this uh, uh, 200 generation, we didn't see any appreciable jump in the uh, fitness in terms of growth rate. So we eventually stopped the experiment at that point. Uh, believing that this is the maximum growth rate this strain can acquire. And this evolution experiment has been done with three replicates. So what you see written uh, ALE1, ALE2, ALE3 is uh, uh, three replicates which, which are uh, evolved from this deleted strain delta UVIC. Now, 
during evolution we observed that there was a uh, some bit of uh, growth rate so we observed that there was some bit of growth rate improvement so we wanted to see what is causing that growth rate improvement uh, one thing that i am not talking about right now is that all three uh, replicate acquired a convergent mutation so all three strains have mutation in one common gene so we believe that that's the causal mutation but the reason i am not talking about is that uh, we have not looked into the mechanistic impact of that mutation and that's something we will probe sometime uh, in our group the mutation was acquired at the end of the experiment in 500 generation or we no. find that along the way when it was evolving that small number that it had so this yeah. mutation was evolved i mean you you pick that mutation up right at the end of the curve yeah so uh, what we have done is that uh, we have done uh, genome sequencing at multiple uh, uh, from multiple generations and what we observed that this mutation happened uh, some around something around uh, i think uh, 70 75 uh, uh, 70 or 75 uh, yeah i think about 75th generation also so less than 100 generation this mutation ha- okay. occurred and it's that mutation it's on the way basically yes so that is one uh, that is another reason why we will believe that that mutation is the causal mutation and this mutation in this gene called pdhr so pdhr is the pyruvate dehydrogenase regulator okay same gene mutation but not the same mutation no but they had the same growth rate effect yes okay. and uh, only reason i am shying away from talking about that mutation a lot is that uh, we do not have a mechanistic interpretation for that right now we only have uh, uh, what do you say one is that that mutation is present in all three replicate so that's one indicator that is causal mutation and another what we just now discussed that uh, uh, that mutation happened when this jump was happening So as at the uh, after evolution, we observed that the growth rate improved, and we wanted to figure out what's causing this uh, growth rate improvement. So we looked into uh, the associated uh, parameters which are associated with the bioenergetics, uh, oxygen uptake rate, glucose uptake rate, acetate secretion. For that matter, we have looked into multiple different uh, metabolites. It's just that uh, these are the ones which uh, showed some interesting pattern, especially oxygen and lactate. So what you see is that uh, UVI C related strain. in this case oxygen uptake rate has gone down and parallelly lactate secretion rate has gone up which is an indicator that now the strain is becoming more and more fermentative in nature after evolution now oxygen uptake rate has gone up and lactate secretion rate has gone substantially down so after evolution now these strains are again being able to respire aerobically so they are now more dependent on oxidative phosphorylation with that uh, uh, since we observed that uh, now they are becoming more and more uh, aerobic in nature we also wanted to look at uh, what is the impact uh, in terms of uh, its uh, uh, what is happening to its uh, uh, glycolytic uh, pathways and uh, the reason i'm talking about glycolytic pathways that uh, uh, in microbes uh, there are these two very interesting uh, uh, pathways for uh, glycolysis uh, emp pathway and ed pathway and uh, this uh, particular uh, map is from uh, ron millo's paper in pns where uh, ron millo is again a great guy all my younger colleagues please follow him please follow his work he always talks about numbers so he has looked into this uh, emp pathway and ed pathway and uh, he has tried to see what is the trade off between these two pathways and what he has reported is that emp pathway is more efficient in producing atp okay so for uh, every molecule of glucose you have one extra atp produce if emp pathway is operative whereas adp path ed pathway is less efficient in terms of production of atp but ed pathway has lesser demand in terms of protein so its protein cost is less now if you look at this uh, uh, in context of uh, uh, the data that we generated is that what is happening is that uh, uh, the uvic deleted strain which is mostly relying on uh, naphthalene for its respiration this strain is switching its uh, glycolytic pathway and it is uh, going away from ed pathway towards emp pathway and the uh, probable explanation for this is now that uh, the strain is more fermentative in nature its atp supply is not primarily from its electron transport chain so it has to use all the pathways from where it can have maximal atp production so that's why now this strain is going more towards 
higher ATP efficiency dependent pathway, which is a higher ATP uh, producing pathway, which is the EMP pathway. After So uh, when you say the protein cost, is it the number of proteins involved in that pathway? I mean, there may be um, multiple proteins, right? Uh, yeah. Which we are not aware there, of. There are, oh, no. So fortunately, we know all the proteins which are involved in this pathways. All right. Yeah. And uh, these are not just the number of proteins. These are also about uh, what are the cofactors involved? Uh, what is the catalytic uh, turnover rate of those proteins? So it accounts for everything. And uh, are these studies done for almost all pathways or this is just for these two in pathways? This, in this particular work, they have done it for uh, ED pathway and EMP pathway. And so this is published in PNS, the exact I think in... cost that is required in terms of the energy spent to be able to uh, make one pathway functional over yeah. the other. So that protein cost actually involves everything associated with the uh, utilization of glucose through either ED pathway or EMP pathway. Interesting. So it is not just number of proteins. It's everything associated with it. Okay. And of course, in case of like, you may have an enzyme, which is very uh, efficient in its uh, catalytic activity, then you do not need to produce lots of that enzyme. But then if you have a sluggish enzyme, whose uh, catalytic efficiency is not as good, then you need to produce that enzyme more in number or quantity to achieve the same flux rate. Okay. So all those things have been uh, taken in account when uh, uh, calculating the trade-off between ED pathway and EMP pathway. Okay. So in case of UVI, can I, can I quickly ask, sure. how did you identify that it goes through the EMP pathway? You actually isolated fructose or oh, did you isolate oh, the oh, intermediates? Uh, sorry. So uh, I, I kind of, uh, I, I made a logical jump over here. Sorry. So okay. let me go back. Uh, this work has been done by uh, my colleague K Chan. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about uh, two of these modeling dependent uh, works, one by K Chan and another by Lawrence Yang. I was really, really fortunate to be in that lab when they too were there. They are excellent uh, system biologists. So this has been done using a ME model. So metabolite, uh, metabolite and expression uh, model of uh, E. coli. Okay. And the name of the model is fold me. And uh, using that model, what has been done over here is a simulation study. Okay. So first of all, uh, we had experimentally generated uh, data for uh, these metabolites not all, some of them. So all those data were fixed into it. And then uh, we had uh, information about the growth rate of those strains. So using all those things, we constrained the model. And then on top of that, we layered the expression data, transcriptome data to see how is this pathway uh, uh, appearing, which pathway, like what is the uh, flux status of these pathways? And another thing is that uh, the transcriptome data was uh, layered after normalization with the ribosomal proteins, because uh, if you don't do the normalization, then the this visualization become meaningless. Okay, so once when when we did all that, uh, what we observed that in case of UVIC uh, and deleted strain, there was more of EMP pathway than ED pathway, uh, because they are now relying on this pathway for their ATP supply. But then after evolution, they have again restored their oxidative phosphorylation. Now their dependence on uh, glycolysis for their ATP supply is not as high. So now they are trying to have a fast operating glycolytic pathway so that they can have their main supply of ATP from oxidative phosphorylation or electron transport system. So now they again went back to ED pathway. I hope I'm making sense. Okay. So as said, uh, another genius, Lawrence Yang. So he has now set up a lab at Queens in Canada. So any of you, again, my young colleague, if you have interest in systems biology, if you want to pursue some uh, career, he's the guy. Okay. Um, what he has done over here is, uh, uh, I think, uh, and since JD also talked about uh, this heterodox potential and everything, we wanted to see uh, why one of the molecule is causing this growth rate bottleneck. When you have uviconone, you go all the way one per hour, whereas if you don't have, then you only are restricted to about 0.7 per hour. So we already had some information from uh, literature and uh, as said, we already knew about the redox potential of these molecules. And uh, because of, as I described the ring structure, uh, the chances that uh, uh, ubiquinone can go back to its uh, quinol form is lesser compared to nephroquinone going back to its nephroquinol form. So we try to now again simulate whether that will explain the growth rate re retardation. So what we have done is that we have looked at 
what will be the electron leak percent from electron transport chain and what will be its impact on the growth rate so now we are in the model we have created a pseudo reaction which is leaking electron now in response to that leaking electron there will be production of reactive oxygen species to quench that reaction species uh, reactive oxygen species you have to produce all the enzymes responsible for mitigation of reactive oxygen species okay be it uh, superoxide dismutase catalase etc okay so that's what have been looked upon over here that uh, when you go on increasing the leak percent does it impact growth rate, growth rate or not so we do see that is uh, explaining uh, how this uh, growth rate is uh, uh, getting retarded yeah it's complete simulation all right so uh, i'm just trying to get a sense of this so uh, there will be reactive oxygen species generated by a lot of other processes in yes. the cell which yes. is already happening yes so uh, that's that, why i said that we have introduced fact, one pseudo reaction yeah so th that's the fact that you have exploited because uh, mitigation of ross will require yes. a lot of energy yes. but this can also be explained by other possibilities right a apart from just a leak in electrons i, I don't know I, I mean i'm just trying to understand that uh, this electron transport chain might go wrong at a lot of other places than just this leak percentage so how did you bank on this parameter so when you are trying to introduce a pseudo reaction also you would want to choose the best pseudo reaction yes. yeah so how was this decision taken That's okay so that decision was again based on chemistry chemical principle of these molecules so as said we knew that uh, if you do not have uricanon if you are using naproxenon the chances of auto oxidation will be higher and the side effect of auto oxidation is electron getting leaked so normally in electron transport chain what happens is that you have this nadh dehydrogenase electron from here goes to these quinones and these quinones hold this electron and then they travel to cytochrome oxidase okay now this electron is given to cytochrome oxidase from there now you have oxygen and will get transferred to oxygen that will now take care of it because oxygen will get reduced to water the electron is gone now when you have a less stable molecule in terms of its electron holding capacity then what will happen is that naproxenon will take electron from here and before it reaches to cytochrome oxidase it might leak electron okay so this leaking electron will cause those uh, just just a very vague uh, uh, extrapolation uh, sure. uh, can you isolate these enzymes and look at these intermediates and yes, look yes, at the yes, yes yes oh yeah. all right yeah that data is available yeah electron transport chain now we are in a situation where we can reconstitute almost everything of electron transport chain we can have artificial membrane within which we can have these uh, uh, enzymes created and then we can play around with whatever quinone you want to add and see how much electron is leaking we can have read uh, read out for those leaking electrons also yeah that was that was my question yeah uh, just a vague uh, possibility could you consider uh, the the actually half life of the reduced or the oxidized forms of uh, naphthenone or ubiquinone in this context and whether the mobility in the periplasmic space mm -hmm. because that's going to determine your half life and the holding capacity if you don't reach the acceptor at a particular time scale mm -hmm. you, the chance of leaking is high okay so uh, although they have the same prenoid structures yeah uh, still given the structural variations uh, is there a possibility that the mobility in the periplasmic place is also affected um thank you for helping with the answer as well so as you said because they have similar isoprenoid uh, tail so i do not think that their mobility in the membrane will be drastically different or significantly different uh, the ring structure is primarily for its a uh, uh with that uh, i do not think uh, i or anyone else has a clear idea or a clear number to associate for the uh, mobility rate for these quinone types but i if i have to make a guess then probably it will not be very different yeah okay now um as said the, the previous slide was all about uh, uh, simulation 
we wanted to see whether that simulation has some real meaning or not. So again, we went back to our uh, expression data and what we observed that actually in case of all the evolved strain, oh, I can use this. So what you see over here is uh, a panel of genes whose uh, proteins are involved in ROS mitigation. So you have SOT C, SOT B and SOT A. These are three different uh, superoxide dismutases. The reason I'm focusing uh, on these uh, three is that uh, SOT C is a very special superoxide dismutase. It functions in the periplasmic space, whereas SOT B and SOT A are cytosolic superoxide dismutase. So SOT C is dedicated to take care of the electron leaking from electron transport chain. And you see in this case, all three replicate, uh, all three independently evolved lineages of UBIC have higher expression of SOT C. Okay. So now this is giving biological context to previous simulation that yes, the strains are now upregulating those enzymes responsible for detoxifying uh, reactive oxygen species. Observed, uh, at the end of the curve, again, I just trying to get a sense of where this change was observed in the, the fold change. So, uh, you're talking about which uh, uh, place? Yeah, in, in that growth curve. At the end of the growth curve was this transcriptomic data. Obtained. You're talking about growth curve or evolution trajectory? growth curve so uh, no evolution trajectory evolution trajectory. Number of, yeah, the number yeah. Of... i got i got your yeah. point so in the evolution trajectory uh, what we do is that we first go about this genome sequencing that we do for multiple different uh, uh, generations uh, multiple different uh, uh, time points but then when we go on doing the final characterization we mostly use the most yeah but then if i have to guess if i do the same study with the uh, so right now this has been done with the, that 900th generation but if I do this study with, uh, let's say, 200th generation, I'll find the same uh, phenomenon. Because from 200 to 900, we didn't see any major change in its uh, uh, growth behavior. So I believe uh, there won't be any um, major difference. Okay. So uh, that was about uh, sort C. And similarly, we have observed that uh, uh, catalase, uh, again, the most effective catalase, that is cat E, its expression is high in uh, all the evolved strains. Uh, so in sum, what it's showing is that uh, uh, all the evolved strains are now upregulating a subset of ROS detoxifying uh, enzymes to take care of the enzymes, uh, the electrons which are leaking from electron transport chain. And that's how they are being able to uh, utilize their oxidative phosphorylation, which was not the case in the pre evolved strain, that is, delta UVIC strain. And that's why they become more and more fermentative instead of getting their energy supply from. Uh, System. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's the, the, the question that you answered is a great question. It should also be sort of thought of whether in the initial part of your evolutionary I mean, growth, right? Yeah. You uh, did, do you see same amount of expression? It, does it happen instantaneously that you suddenly see that the, all of these, but it took time for evolution to set in. When you, you immediately had an upregulation of the superoxide and the catalase, uh, superoxide dismutase and the catalase enzymes. Yeah. And then you actually, the organism feels that it's, it's yeah, I, I got there's a point. mutation. I got your right? point. So, just on, I mean, sure. Extrapolating again that uh, maybe you have an inducible vector uh, that can compensate for that mutation. Mm -hmm. And you say evolve it without inducing that expression of that gene you bring it back down so my point is i mean uh, reversing the thing so if you have this so, expression i think probably we can have this detailed discussion later let me finish this talk let me finish let me finish you don't have students asking questions let me finish let me finish the question so uh, i mean sorry i i might be alienated others who are not being coming i'll answer very quickly i'll answer very quickly I mean, uh, let's, I, I'll just go, I'll no, so just ask, ask I, I, I got the feel of your question. Okay. So I'll suggest you to wait for almost a year. <laughs> One of my group members will actually uh, uh, take on this project, okay, where we will try to establish the relevance of that PDHR mutation in these strains. Okay. If we, if we figure out that uh, that mutation is causing this, then we'll get the answer to what you're asking. Okay. And then um, uh, the second uh, uh, panel is uh, kind of a validation for all these things. So we have used two different uh, uh, molecule which have different ways of generating reactive oxygen species. Uh, peroxide generates, as the name says, hydrogen peroxide generates uh, peroxide, whereas paracots generates superoxide. And now in periplasmic space, superoxide is the major problem. 
So what you can see is that this uh, pre-wall strain delta UBIC has higher susceptibility towards paracot and all the evolved strains are more tolerant towards paracot. And that's because now they have this higher expression of uh, this uh, uh, ROS detoxifying enzymes, okay? With that, uh, uh, so that was all about uh, uh, this whole evolution of uh, uh, nephroquinone dependent strain. Now we also wanted to look into if ubiquinone is a superior molecule, if ubiquinone is the molecule that can hold electrons stably, then why this oscillation takes place? Okay, for that right now, what I'm showing over here is uh, some sort of back of the envelope calcul calculation. Take it with a pinch of salt. And what we have tried to look at, what is the cost parameter in terms of production of ubiquinone or nephroquinone? Okay, we have looked at how many mole of ATP will be required for every mole of lisquinone synthesis. Similarly, glucose, oxygen, and carbon. The parameter that uh, was more interesting or uh, most interesting was uh, mole oxygen required for every mole of quinone bisynthesized. That was higher for ubiquinone compared to nephroquinone. So, it looks like the cost consideration for ubiquinone is inversely proportional to oxygen. Okay, so if in the environment there is lots of oxygen, which is the case in aerobic environment, strain does not really care about this cost. Okay, but if you go towards microaerobic environment, if you go into anaerobic environment, then the strain actually have to care for it, and then in that case they go for a molecule which is cheaper in terms of its oxygen requirement. Okay. Probably that's the reason for this oscillation. Again, we have not uh, asset. Uh, please take this result with a pin, uh, pinch of salt. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm coming back to the slide because uh, now what I'm going to talk about is again. Uh, so this is just a idea, and the result will uh, or the full length talk about this will be given by one of my lab member. So what we are now trying to do over here is we first looked at um, what is the bottleneck in uh, nephroquinone dependent strain. Okay, now it's known fact that uh, ubiquinone kind of molecule because of this benzoquinone ring are toxic to cells. Okay, so the question is how during this whole transition of uh, uh, anaerobic to aerobic uh, earth environment, these microbes learn to utilize ubiquinone. Okay. Why is that how they got to biosynthetic pathway? There have been lots of studies done for all those horizontal gene transfer, everything, everything. But then what we want to figure out, what was the metabolic adap uh, adaptation that enabled them to use this toxic metabolite for their advantage? Okay, so for that, we are gonna again do some sort of creation. What we'll do is that we'll take a strain that only forms a primitive quinone. In that, we'll stitch biosynthetic pathway for the modern quinone. And then we'll see what is its impact on growth proximally and distally. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll, we'll uh, talk about that sometime later when we have some more data on it. Right now, it's all hypothesis. And uh, another project that we have started, and in fact, uh, uh, it got started during my postdoc uh, uh, work only because uh, of this whole pandemic and that got that uh, delayed my arrival at TFR. So I started looking into it. So what we are trying to do over here is that uh, we are looking at, uh, so in electron transport system, especially battery electron transport system, there are alternate uh, pathways. Okay. In case of E. coli, there are four major pathways for taking electron from NADS and transferring it to oxygen. We wanted to see what is causing the, what is the uh, physiological relevance of this uh, plasticity or flexibility. Okay. So one is that, and of course there are some answer for it that uh, maybe different conditions require different kinds of pathways. So there is one answer, that's a very clear answer. But then when we started doing this study, what we observed that uh, these uh, different, uh, like uh, we have generated four different uh, strains. Now they do not have this flexibility of switching uh, one of the four pathways. They are hardwired to use one of the possible pathway. Their growth rate were different. The initial growth rate, the pre-evolved growth rate were different. But after evolution, they again acquired similar growth rate, okay? And in order to uh, achieve that similar growth rate, these strains acquired mutation in different pathways, which is suggesting that, um, which is suggesting that uh, these strains or these pathways are working at their suboptimal level in the natural system. In order to achieve that optimality, they have to play around with their genetic constitution. So those are the things that we are now probing into the group. So that's about that. And then, um, yeah.
You said five minutes. I'll take five minutes for the acknowledgement. Okay. Um, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure working in DBS for multiple reason. Um, maybe the buildings are not that good, but that is more than compensated by the kind of peers I have. And then another fun of working in TIFR is the excellent uh, students pool that you have. So, um, Stuti and Neha, you are in DBS, so I am like uh, free to use your pictures. Okay, yeah. And then um, uh, special thanks to Parma, Veera, and Bobby for their help. Right now, we are they are helping day and night, uh, allowing us to set up the lab, getting everything, everything. And then uh, TIFR and uh, DBT for opening their. Uh, yeah. With that, um, of course, I should acknowledge my postdoc lab where I have done all the uh, Neptunian related work. And then I said, I will not leave this podium. See, that's not a conference, right? It's a yeah. lab. It's a lab. It's a lab. It's a lab. It's a lab. Yes. Uh, I said, I will not leave this podium uh, with the showing microbes as a villain. So these microbes actually turn a grumpy kid into a smiling kid. So this particular kid gets this uh, suspension of live microbes every day. And that allows him to have better metabolism. And that allows him to have a better smile. And then that's not only for those kids. It's true for us. We, again, uh, this number, these numbers are from Ron Milo. I'm a big fan of him. So at every, uh, whenever I get opportunity, I advocate for him. So these numbers are again from uh, Ron Milo's work, where he has shown that we are half eukaryote, half prokaryotes. So with that, thank you so much. And if there is any kind of question. Thank you very much. This was uh, fantastic. And there's so much uh, excitement. Okay, so we, uh, we, have, we have time for questions. So I'll go with people who are attending AG66 first, and then the Zoom audience. So any questions uh, from the or, uh, AG66? Yes, yes. Krishan. So uh, if you look at the uh, metabolic flux or, you know, the, especially the uh, electron transport efficiency in the you know, naturally slow growing bacteria. So what would be the uh, kind of mechanism because of which you think that the naturally, because naturally slow growing bacteria also have a certain advantage. Yeah. Not every bacteria has to grow. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, in nature, it's more advantageous to grow slower than faster. So how does the, you know, is there any modifications on the BP known pathway? I think that's not solely because of uh, their energetics. That has a lot to do with their uh, other uh, components of their metabolism. But yeah. Do you think that metabolism will have a, I mean, especially electron transport chain will be tweaked in those situations? Let me see. So one of the slowest uh, bacteria that I know of is microbiome tuberculosis. And uh, electron transport system of like microbiome tuberculosis is quite efficient. So I may be wrong, but I do not think electron transport system per se will explain uh, their slower growth. Yeah, can I maybe add to that? It's not just about growth potential. Most of the energy can be spent on just surviving yeah. in, a host, in a hostile environment. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. That so for example, it's not just the growth potential. It's not about fast dividing versus slow dividing. In most organisms which are very efficient bioenergetic potentials, most of the bioenergetic potential is actually used for survival rather than yes. growth. Yeah. So that is something that uh, is very important to keep in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So uh, you said that there are uh, some bacteria that also have only nitrogen or only quinone. Come again. You have some. There are some bacteria that only have nitrogen or only have quinones, right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, uh, for those naturally occurring bacteria that have uh, only nitrogen or only quinone, how yeah. does their growth rate compare to the, uh, uh, to yeah. the uh, mutants that you created? So I'll again take uh, uh, help of Ulas's comment. Uh, it will not be, it's not good to do that head-on-head uh, head head comparison between uh, species that have uh, both the quinones with the species that have one of the quinone. Okay or species that have eukinon or the species that have nephokinon because their growth condition is different. Physiology is different. Their environment is different. So there's a lot of factors in impacting their growth rate. So that's why when I had to probe 
uh, importance of nephropenone, I used E. coli. I used the strain that has this biosynthetic ability so that I do not have to do this comparison with any other species. Okay, I have done that comparison within the species, within the strain. Okay. But then that will be like really, really, very really interesting. And like I can uh, probably add to that is that uh, uh, the last project, the penultimate project that I talked about, where we are trying to stitch eukanon biosynthetic pathway uh, in a nephropenone dependent strain to figure out how this pathway was or the, how this molecule was adopted into the electron transport system. That motivation has triggered from one of the study, which is very similar to what you were describing. So what they have done is that they have taken uh, two sets of uh, microbes. One that produce ubiquinon, another that cannot, okay? Now what they have done, and these are different, different species, not the strain, different species. And they have compared these species for their tolerance for benzoquinone, okay? What they observed that the strains that have this ubiquinon biosynthetic pathway, they were more tolerant to benzoquinone, okay? Which suggests that they definitely, has, they definitely have something to mitigate the damage due to these benzoquinone kind of molecules. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. So um, that's actually one of the things like right now one of the major bottleneck of adaptive laboratory evolution that's being practiced uh, elsewhere in the world is that uh, they are using it for very what do you say very simple kind of uh, work they simply use growth rate as the readout and they will all they will look for antibiotic tolerance they will look for whatever they have to look just uh, using uh, growth rate as the readout in our group now we are trying to set up different different models or different different readouts for uh, uh, evolution and that's when we will we will be able to tease out the kind of information that you are saying, or uh, the energetic potential and their uh, association with the growth behavior of the strains. Yeah, this is just for my clarification. Sure. So, in the uh, laboratory evolved strains, as you see that post the saturation phase, when they evolved till a certain extent, you see some mutations or some changes. Yeah. And so you, like in this, uh, as well as experiment suggested, those are like key mutations for them to evolve, say, for example. So does one, like, can one perform experiments wherein, say, in the same Delta UBIC strains, one does, does introduce just that single mutation, just to make sure as in, if they evolve actually faster and there is no other effect from any other mutation. Restore or oh, yeah. To see whether that mutation is being able to restore that fitness or not, it may happen that uh, that mutation, uh, uh, despite being in all three replicate, may not be able to restore the uh, the fitness. It will be because of there. There are times when two mutation together enable that fitness. Okay, so we will we will be looking into those things. Yeah. Uh, Amitesh, I had a question. Yes. Yeah. So you mentioned that there are two pathways in glycolysis, the EMP pathway and the ED pathway. Yes. So is the ED pathway found in any new eukaryotes in the eukaryotes, basically? Oh my God. Well, last help. No. So even in the cells which are solely dependent on glycolysis, like being uh, the cells who are having Warburg effect in cancer or during the endothelial uh, growth, don't they even have the ED pathway? Because it seems that it has less protein turnover rate. It might be more helpful for them. Yeah. So are you asking why they do not have it? Yes. 
Um, why your system does not have ED password? <laughs> Let me see. Um, higher eukaryotes have to do a lot of other things. Okay. And when you go for a more complex system, then you have to compensate uh, or you have to lose some, like you cannot carry everything, right? So that's the philosophical answer to your question. Okay. Is there any biological answer I can think of? To but uh, like any of the reactants, uh, intermediates of ED pathway, are they spotted in any eukaryotic cell or anyone has ever looked if into the it? If pathway is not there, then who will you get the metabolite or the intermediates? Uh, I don't think so. I'm, I'm not, I do not have a very clear answer to your question, but uh, whatever I said is based on uh, my what do you say, understanding of the field. Okay, there are two more questions. I'll take this one first and I then we'll, yeah, because I was patient. Uh, so my question is that in bacterial cells, how do you differentiate between survival and growth rate? Because for complex organisms, I understand experiments that you could look at to separate uh, survival and uh, growth rate. But in bacterial cells, what survival versus growth rate. Mm -hmm. So for microbes, their life is quite simple. They have to grow to survive. And uh, let me see, survive. So if they are if they are surviving, they will oh no, they can go for the latent phase also. Um, so growth rate is quite simple, right? For survival, you can look into whether the strains are uh, alive for a long time. Like uh, uh, in case of microtome tuberculosis, they do not grow uh, when they go into their uh, dormant phase, or at least they do not grow substantially when they go into their dormant phase, but they are alive. So you can check whether they are living or not. So that will tell you about whether they are surviving or not. Was that your question? Did I answer it? Okay. Can I just take one question? Yeah. Ronnie, could you ask your question? Uh, hello, am I audible? Hi, Ronnie, yes. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. So uh, one, since someone else had asked about uh, like, uh, if you have multi-step evolution of uh, regarding uh, antibiotic resistance. So I recently came across a paper which uh, looks at mathematical modeling of, uh, uh, and in that, what they're saying is, what they have done is they have given an adaptive regime of uh, anti antibiotics, which basically means that at each step, you are uh, looking at the patient and figuring out their microbial load and uh, giving the antibiotic accordingly. And they figured out that for that uh, specific set of uh, uh, parameters, basically, uh, you, you get, if you have multi-step evolution, it's better to continue adaptive regime rather than trying to kill the entire bacterial population at one go. So I was just thinking whether one can sort of uh, mimic this adaptive uh, microbial, uh, antimicrobial uh, condition uh -huh. in, in the lab. So, and how does one do so? Yeah, we can do that. And uh, those who are working in the field of adaptive laboratory evolution, uh, they do this a lot. And uh, in fact, uh, the major motivation for them uh, doing this laboratory evolution is to look into this antibiotic, uh, antimicrobial resistance. So in order to do that, again, uh, you can just play around with the dosing and uh, try looking into uh, what's the impact of uh, their both in terms of their killing and uh, how soon they are being able to uh, co come up with the adaptive strategy or uh, compensatory mutation. I see. Okay. Uh, can I ask another question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, as you mentioned that... Uh, uh, chemicals which are uh, in inhibiting the bioenergetics is a primary target, but uh, chemicals which also inhibit, uh, I mean, disrupt the bacterial membrane are also viable targets because they sort of reduce the uh, rate of evolution which can be uh, done against them. But uh, like, can you give an idea of um, why these uh, like antimicrobial peptides or antimicrobial polymers are uh, not that well known compared to uh, antibiotics. I missed your. I I, I don't think I got your question completely uh, clearly. Are you saying? Uh, uh, yeah, please. Uh, okay. 
okay that might be something to do with the complication associated with the development of uh, uh, peptides and all as uh, uh, antimicrobials instead of uh, their uh, actual biological uh, impact on as uh, antimicrobial i see okay okay so it has to do with more with like the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics rather than uh, their exact activity yeah like if if they are being able to hit the same target or you know, some other target but then if you are they are being able to bring the same growth inhibiting uh, uh, effect then uh, from the biological perspective i do not see any issue it's just that uh, what may happen is that the formulation of these chemical molecules might be different in terms of when, whether it's uh, some sort of uh, like every molecule is chemical molecule but then if it is peptide then uh, its formulation will be very different its production will be different so those things might be uh, making these uh, lesser popular uh, uh, molecules in the in the field of uh, antimicrobials i see thank you thank you very much okay. so i had a question from redox potential of naphthoquinone versus uh, ubiquinone so uh, since uh, ubiquinone has higher redox potential than uh, naphthoquinone and it makes its means uh, good uh, electron acceptor right but when it comes to release of electron because since it's working as a carrier so don't you think that bacteria means uh, require some some more energy to get electrons from the uh, ubiquinone as see, compared to the i see your point so uh, both uh, nephoquinone and ubiquinone function uh, within uh, between the same uh, energy dehydrogenase and oxidase and these oxidases have a uh, much higher redox potential compared to uh, ubiquinone or nephoquinone so they can easily take electron from uh, uh, these molecules but it means for them it's a, it is harder for uh, taking electron from the uh, ubiquinone as compared to the mm -hmm. uh, because because uh, redox potential of uh, ubiquinone is higher right it, it yes. releases electron uh, less easily yeah i i see your point but i do not think that uh, that has a very uh, what is it quantitative impact on uh, the downstream complex like the down the redox potential of the downstream complex is uh, suited enough to take electron from uh, ubiquinone or nephoquinone quite easily yeah so what what is happening is that because uh, uh, it is important to consider not just the redox potential which is of course the primary thing uh, for thermodynamics uh, but also the rates are important the re the electron transfer rates are dictated by redox potential however they are not just dictated by the re redox potential it also depends on the binding of these to the the protein parts so it's important to consider all of that together not just look at so if the rates are now different if you claim by redox potential that is the driving force if the rates are different then all these questions that arouse about leakage of electrons become an important uh, parameter to look at because the rates really are dictated by other things not just redox potential they are driven by thermodynamics but even a large redox potential change between the donor and the acceptor can re reduce the electron transfer rate so you don't want too large you don't want too small you want just the goldilocks kind of thing right optimum okay so that's 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 it's a complicated yeah to the cytochrome redox uh, oxidase will also change its redox potential yeah. so it's a cooperative effect in some sense cooperative in a very weird sense that the you know, binding of naphthoquinone and ubiquinone may not induce the same structural change and therefore you will have different kinetic and uh, redox uh, efficiency so it's it's not just hawa mein electron ja raha hai because of the potential you have to have a binding so that that is important right so yeah so um okay so i think uh, we can safely stop here at uh, 536 it was fantastic amitesh i want a big round of applause from the audience here this is what we want to hear the speakers missed this out as well as the zoom audience for sticking around for so long i i know some of them left but um it was it was it was a great audience from that side as well and this side so so now you recognize that apart from things you have seen in rocket boys that homi baba did 
this colloquium series is alive okay so this is his contribution in thinking of the growth of how this institute has to happen so okay 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 we we don't want to discuss some right now is he so <laughs> but 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 thank you for joining in and um uh, i i i cannot promise tea for all of you today next time i will definitely but if you want to uh, come for tea i can uh, fund right now so thanks <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can i can thank you krishanu thank you ulas thank you uh, oh and one more thing very interestingly because we have gone online with colloquia this I, i'm trying one more thing uh, on 9th of march we are having from the gender harmony cell a screening of a actually a movie on um um mariam Mir Mir mirza khan who, who is actually uh, she is a posthumous mathematician um, she is she was a very famous women mathematician um, is from stanford so we have a screening in this room uh, exactly at the colloquium time from 4 to 5:30 uh, if you are interested please do come um, it's about a leading mathematician and her life okay so yeah thank you